Thank you very much. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for the kind invitation to come here to this wonderful place. As our chairman already said, I'm going to talk about Nicolet Superconductors, a renaissance of the one-band Hubbard model. As the title already suggests, based on up initial calculations, I will put forward a very simple picture for the physics of Nicolaites based on a one-band Hubbard model for the nickel x squared minus y squared orbital plus largely decoupled pockets. Um, we will then see that this simple description agrees with, with most of the well-established experiments. I will show that later to you. But, but we will also have two further speakers in this first session. So Ariando Ariando will discuss on the experimental side in the next talk. And then Frank Lechermann will put forward another picture for the theory where instead of these pockets, you have a nickel z squared orbital as a second orbital involved. Before I start, I'd like to thank my co-workers and let me in particular pick out these young guys, Liang Si, Mutuharu Kitatani, and Paul Worm, who did most of the actual calculations. Three years ago, we entered a new age of superconductivity um, with an enormous experimental and theoretical activity. So after the um, copper age and the iron age, we are now in the nickel age, and as you see here, the TC has started to increase. It will increase further that I'm sure of whether it will ever surpass the cuprate TC. It's questionable. My motivation, however, is also not to, to get a room temperature superconductor out of the nickelates, but the, that these nickelates are at the same time very similar, but also decisively different to the cuprates. So the iron pnictides are a completely different kind of system. But the nickelates and the cuprates have so much similarity, but, but also are more different than the cuprates among themselves, so that we have high hopes that they will allow us to better discriminate the essentials from the incidentals for high temperature superconductivity and eventually to better understand ITC. The outline of my talk is as follows. I will start with the electronic structure and the up initial calculation, then the defunctional theory and dynamical mean field theory. And then I will arrive at this simple minimal description with only uh, the x squared minus y squared correlated orbital and the largely decoupled pocket, in particular the A pocket. Based on this simple description, we have then calculated the superconducting dome at a time where only uh, two experimental data points at 20% uh, doping were available by Harold Wang and Ariando Ariando, and, and we predicted the whole doping dependence when, when you only had 20% doping. And this prediction has now been experimentally confirmed uh, with a breathtaking uh, accuracy much better than, than we had expected. Um, and, and this is thanks to new defect free films. I will briefly discuss it. I will then also show that um, finite layer nickelates nicely match into this overall picture and uh, if time allows at the end discuss how to increase TC, um, for example, by using pressure, strain or palladates. All right, so if you want to understand nickelates, how it looks like, give a, make a theoretical modeling, the very first thing you, you should do is density functional theory calculations. And indeed, such DFT calculations have been done more than 30 years ago by Vladimir Anisimov. And based on these DFT calculations, he concluded that nickelates are cuprate analogons, and because of that, should be superconducting. Now, this theoretical prediction was extremely difficult to verify in experiment. It's, uh, Ariando might tell us more about that. It's uh, very difficult to synthesize these nickelates, and, and it took 30 years before um, uh, Dan Feng Li and uh, Harold Wang were able to see the superconducting tr transition in strontium doped neodymium nickelate. And then people already started to, to doubt the rid of oxygen and to use hydrogen for this reduction, and then it is very easily possible that you end up with excess hydrogen as we, we predicted, and the Keimer group recently has nicely demonstrated, or, or you can also have some excess oxygen. So, so these films are really prone 
to disorder or stacking faults in, in Z1 has to take into account. Okay, now let's go to the theoretical modeling and let's start with the very basics. So that is the crystal structure. It's identical, the infinite layer structure, to the arguably simple, but certainly not best, cuprate superconductor, calcium kappa O2. Here you have the uh, nickel oxygen 2 layer, and then you have a neodymium or other rare earth spacing layer, and this you have a neodymium or other rare earth spacing layer, and this pattern is uh, continued or repeated ad infinitum. And therefore it's called infinite layer structure, and if you make the formal valency count, copper is 2 plus, nickel being to the left in the periodic table is plus 1, which is difficult to obtain, and then both of them have a 3D9 basic electronic configuration. So, so that speaks very much on, on similarities of these compounds, but now let's go into the details and then we will also see differences. Um, that is the DFT uh, band structure of calcium copper O2 and lanthanum nickel O2, and um, they are quite similar but also different in, in some aspects. So you see here the x squared minus y squared orbital crossing the Fermi level. It gives rise to these hole like uh, Fermi surfaces. Or if you go to the, it's hard to see, a red dashed uh, or red uh, uh, um, first prion zone, then you have four of these Fermi pocket sheets in the cuprates, as, as uh, you know. Now that is the. Um, weakly interacting picture. Now if electronic correlations come into play, uh, these, uh, uh, this x squared minus y squared orbital splits into two Hubbard bands. And then for the cuprates, it is such that uh, the oxygen orbitals are closest, closer to the Fermi level than the lower Hubbard band. And because of that, if you hold up the cuprates, um, you get uh, uh, the holes into the oxygen, so cuprates in the Zahn and Zawatzky Allen scheme are a charge transfer insulator. Still, um, a Hubbard model can be used as an effective description, but, but um, with, with some uh, uh, working around uh, to make it, um, to justify it. Now, how about the um, nickelates? They also have this x squared minus y squared orbital. It has a very similar uh, hole-like Fermi surface. Now, nickel is to the left in the periodic table. And because of that, this x squared minus y squared orbital is pushed higher in energy with one electron. And because of that, it's further away from the oxygen. And because of that, nickelates are not charged transfer um, insulators, so, so the holes should go also into this uh, nickel x squared minus y squared orbital. But then it's also closer to the lanthanum or neodymium bands, and that you see here at this A and gamma momentum, these bands cross the Fermi level and give rise to this um, uh, gamma and A electron pocket. So you have in DFT a mixture of a hole like Fermi surface and, and two pockets that you have here. Now Frank will talk more about the z squared orbital that is uh, further or lower in energy in the cuprates, in the nickelates it's somewhat closer to the Fermi energy. Again this was just a DFT picture and now we have to think what correlations do as, as for the cuprates where you get a charge transfer insulator and to this end we have done DFT plus DMFT calculations based on all nickel and all neodymium 3D and 5D uh, orbitals. Um, and if you can see it from the back here, what you see is first of all a strong quasi-particle renormalization. So that white line here is a DFT band structure and you get a renormalization by about a factor of five. You also get some finite lifetimes, therefore you have these broadened energy levels. Um, and, uh, but you see still here that's the x squared minus y squared orbital and you still have an A pocket. The gamma pocket, which was there um, without correlation, is now shifted above the Fermi level for lanthanum nickelate, but for neodymium nickelate the gamma pocket still is below um, the Fermi, or the gamma band crosses the Fermi level and you have a gamma pocket. But if you strontium dope the neodymium compound, all this gamma level shifts up and because of that, you see here in, in some compounds, at some dopings, you have the gamma pocket, in others you don't. And because of that, 
we think it is not relevant for high temperature superconductivity in these systems. So um, let's here is, by the way, the z squared orbital um, still below the Fermi energy. And, and let's now, based on these up initial calculations with all uh, d orbits included, get at a simple description. And the simple description is, OK, I have this x squared minus y squared orbital, an a pocket in, in some compounds at low doping, possibly also a gamma pocket. But these two are there all the time, also in the superconducting regime. So these are the relevant orbitals in our calculation. And um, let's use Occam's razor now and, and make the simplest possible description for the nickelates. And that is just using these two orbitals. It becomes even um, uh, more simple because these are these two orbitals, uh, the x squared minus y squared orbital in the nickel oxygen 2 plane and the uh, neodymium xy orbital. And these two orbitals by symmetry don't hybridize. So there is no hopping of electrons sorry, from th between these two orbitals. Um, uh, and, and therefore, as a first approximation, we can consider these two orbitals to be um, decoupled. Um, still, if they are decoupled, um, uh, the, this uh, A-pocket plays a role, because if you strontium dope your system, you put holes into your system. And now, part of the holes will go here, and part of the holes will go there. Um, uh, and, and therefore, one has to carefully consider how many holes are going into this x squared minus y squared orbital or Hubbard band, and how many go to this decoupled um, xy orbital or a pocket. Um, we have calculated um, uh, this fraction uh, that's shown here. On the right hand side for the blue curve, you see the occupation of this x squared minus y squared orbital. And here you see the strontium doping, here for neodymium nickel O2. And you see even at 0% strontium doping, you, own, you have already about 5% holes in your x squared minus y squared orbital. That is because you have electron pockets, so some of the electrons are moved away from the x squared minus y squared orbital and are instead in, uh, uh, in these pockets. And, and that also nicely explains why there is no long-range antiferromagnetism in the nickelates in contrast to the cuprates, where for the parent compound you always have uh, antiferromagnetic long-range order. If you have a 5% cuprate, 5% hold up cuprate, you wouldn't expect uh, uh, long-range antiferromagnetism either. Now, if you further, if you strontium dope the system, some of the holes go here, some go here, and if you look at the slope, it's about 50-50. 50% of the holes, roughly speaking, go to the reservoir, 50% to the Hubbard model. We have then calculated uh, from up initial all the interaction and, and hopping uh, parameters for this one-band Hubbard model, and this translation of strontium doping to the occupation of the x squared minus y squared orbital we still need. Okay. So that is our description, and, and then I will continue with it. But um, uh, let me also point out that at larger doping, this z squared orbital becomes then um, occupied or deoccupied, so occupied with holes, depopulated with electrons, and therefore you have this uh, change of slope here for larger doping. Um, there are a quite a number of, of other theories uh, for the nickelate. So at the beginning, people were very much excited uh, when you only had neodymium nickelate. That wow, now you have an F electron uh, superconductor, and, and people thought it is uh, relevant. So we calculated the the uh, condo temperature. It is so so low that it doesn't play a role. And, and uh, therefore, we didn't think the Fs are relevant. Uh, of course, you still have some spin scatterers, but, but they are not so strongly coupled because you have a very weak hybridization. Um, and uh, then it has been experimentally also ruled out by finding superconductivity also in, in other uh, compounds like lanternum nickelate, where you don't have F electrons. And, and then Frank later will, will put on a, a picture on the relevance of the z-squared orbital. And there are indeed two schools of thinking for the z-squared orbital. 
One uh, is uh, here's a group of, of Haule and uh, Philip Werner, uh, where you have uh, in particular this gamma pocket relevant for the z squared orbital. I, I told you that the gamma pocket is a neodymium or lanthanum derived orbital, but it has a, stri a strong hybridization with a nickel z squared. And because of that, you have something like 15 or 20 percent holes in your original nickel z squared orbital. These this gamma pocket is not strongly correlated, and as I've shown you before, our point of view is that this physics, where you can maybe then have this 15, 20% dope z squared orbital and its spin coupled to the x squared minus y squared orbital, we think that can be relevant physics for lowly doped neodymium nickelate, but since this gamma pocket is so different among different compounds and doping, we don't think it's the relevant point for superconductivity. And there's a second uh, uh, theory uh, by Frank Lechermann, and as he nicely showed, the difference comes uh, about just by using thick uh, density functional theory instead of density functional theory. And, and there you, you get rid of this A pocket, and instead this Z squared um, uh, Fermi surface is, is present for any doping of the system that is similar as in our calculation for, for larger doping. We get similar physics, but only uh, for 25 or 30 percent doping. Okay, that is what I wanted to say about the modeling and, and arriving at this one-band description. Uh, maybe I should also point out, but, but that is very indirect uh, evidence that, that interpretation of Rick's data suggests that the, uh, um, mainly the x squared minus y squared orbital is contributing to the Rick spectrum, but it's not a direct proof. Okay, so now um, that is a pic our picture, only these two ingredients, and let's see how far we come with it. Um, so we, we can now calculate superconductivity. There has been, uh, in recent years, quite some developing um, extending dynamical mean field theory. There's a, a review on that also. Um, and we used to this a dynamical vertex um, uh, uh, approximation, d gamma a. And um, uh, what you can describe here uh, is, among other spin fluctuations, you, you all know spin fluctuations from RPA at weak coupling, but, but now we have in, in these vertices gamma, we have included all the local DMFT correlations already. Um, and because of that, we can now describe spin fluctuations also at strong coupling. There's a nice paper by Thomas Schaefer and others showing that it's these spin fluctuations calculated are in excellent agreement with numerical Monte Carlo results. Indeed, it was such that first the Monte Carlo results differed, but, but then they did a better finite size scaling, and now they agree with the d gamma a calculation. Um, now, these spin fluctuations act um, uh, in, we also treat charge fluctuations uh, on an equal footing, but, but we find here predominant antiferromagnetic spin fluctuations, and these spin fluctuations act as a pairing glue between two electrons in the Cooper channel, in this way give rise to superconductivity. So the method is not biased, we, we can get S or P or D wave superconductivity, but, but for this calculation here, we get D wave superconductivity mediated by antiferromagnetic spin fluctuations. Okay, let's now look um, uh, how things uh, are. Um, the first thing the spin fluctuations modify is uh, your one particle spectrum or your Fermi surface, and that is shown here. Um, remember, 5% doping, that was the parent compound, and only shown here is now the x squared minus y squared orbital. And for the parent compound, you see, similar as for the cuprates here, a pseudo gap in the spectrum. Now, that is the superconducting doping regime where you have nicely pronounced uh, Fermi surfaces. Okay, and next we can calculate superconductivity this way. It's a superconducting TC as a function of strontium doping. And remember, we had to translate the doping to the actual filling of our x squared minus y squared orbital, which is shown up here. Um, and um, that is how it looks like. Uh, in this dark blue regime, we think this one-band description uh, 
is sufficient. We also have an A pocket, but it's decoupled, and the x squared minus y squared, oops, um, orbital is the correlated one which we think is responsible for superconductivity. Now here, in, at low doping, you can have an additional gamma pocket. The physics can be slightly different. Here, at large doping, we, we get also a different physics because then the z squared orbital uh, makes an other Fermi surface. And that is the calculated TC at, as a, at a time where there was only one or two data points at 20% doping available. So this data point. There, were no, there are no free parameters. And the agreement for such a difficult to calculate quantity as a superconducting TC um, is, is quite good. Yeah? Um, and, and then further experiments came, and, and first in uh, 2020, um, uh, also by Ariando Ariando, but I put here all the data from, from the same group uh, in, in Stanford, uh, and you see a superconducting dome. Now here the agreement is, is still uh, with, with the disagreement you had at the beginning, uh, that is what you uh, expected, and of course people were asking us, what uh, are you um, doing uh, wrong here, and we don't feed back the superconducting fluctuations to the antiferromagnetic fluctuations, Therefore, we don't get, for example, a costelet Saulus transition that overestimates TC a little bit. So it, it could have been that it's like that. But then just this year, new experiments with clean film ca came out, and, and they gave this TC. So all we did here is we put these uh, films with the strontium doping onto our phase diagram. And that is really in, in breathtaking agreement. Um, uh, and the difference to the cuprates is that the regime is larger, yeah, but it's only larger as a function of strontium doping. If you go to as a function of the doping of your x squared minus y squared orbital, you have something like 12 to 22 percent. That is similar to the cuprates. Then you have also a little bit um, screwness in, in, in the uh, um, uh, superconducting dome compared to the cuprate, and that is because you have no linear scale here in this doping regime. So all of that is nicely explained. Now, um, why are these films much better? So, so the old films uh, had these uh, um, Rudels and Popper stacking faults, so there's a lot of disorder, and, and the new films don't have this disorder. And uh, this way, the uh, resistivity dropped by a factor of, of three, and the TC was also enhanced by, uh, depending very much on the doping effect of four or two or whatever. So you see here, cleaner films are now in, in excellent agreement with, with our theory. Um, these films are grown on LSAT instead of STO, but you see here, within 1%, the lattice parameters are the same, and that is all what enters in our calculation. Okay, that was the superconducting TC. It's driven by antiferromagnetic fluctuations. So let's compare the antiferromagnetic fluctuations to experiment we co and compare to RICS. Um, that is our paramagnon spectrum, so energy momentum resolved. Um, and that is the paramagnon excitation in theory. And that is the experiment. So again, no parameter fitting. It is just our old data. And we now also calculated the paramagnon um, uh, spectrum. Uh, here you see the maxima of the experiment in red, in theory, in blue, and it is giving a very reasonable agreement. So the experiment is a little bit lower, that means the antiferromagnetic exchange, J, is a little bit lower, but remember it's still here, the, the films with stacking faults. So if you have disorder, our understanding of, of doing a lot of calculation, which I'm not having time today to show with hydrogen, excess hydrogen, is that then you have also, at least locally, some ferromagnetic exchange, some disorder in the exchange, and then you should expect such a difference here. And we, we would now predict that the cleaner films when will then end up somewhere in between the, our theory and the old experiment. Okay, so th that uh, um, gives overall a, a nice uh, agreement. Let's briefly go to the infinite layer, uh, from the infinite to the finite layer compound. Um, so Julia Mundi has grown these five-layer nickelates with one, two, three, four, five nickels. Then the Rudels and Popper uh, 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 spacing layer and then another five layers. As you see here, the hopping parameters are virtually the same. 
That's very different from the cuprates because it's not bulk systems. All of this has been grown on the strontium titanate substrate. And because of that, the five-layer system is very much alike. But of course, the five-layer system now has... Oops. That wasn't me. Okay. Thanks. But of course, the five-layer uh, system now has five surfaces. Um, in DFT, you still have pockets. In DMFT, the pockets are gone. And as the pockets are gone, if you have these five-layer films, you can do the algebra, then you have a filling of 1 over 4 or 20%. So now let's put this data point of the five-layer film into our phase diagram. And it's 20% uh, doping. Um, you have three inequivalent layers, therefore you have a little bit of variance in the doping of the three layers, but it's not much. And this data point is nicely in agreement with previous experiments as well as the D-gamma A calculation. Let me also point out that, that uh, the five-layer compound has a positive Hall coefficient. And that is, of course, clear if you have no pockets, no electron pockets, you only have the whole like x squared minus y squared orbital, and that gives rise to a positive Hall coefficient. Whereas for the infinite layer compound with the pockets, it's small doping, you have negative Hall coefficients, uh, which one would also expect from the uh, theoretical calculation. Okay, so um, uh, let me just uh, briefly uh, say that uh, um, how to increase TC. We see that, that one should have a lower Coulomb interaction to hopping ratio um, uh, that is possible by, by using, for example, pressure, and that has been spectacularly confirmed experimentally that at 12 gigapascal, you have the uh, nickelate superconductors with the largest TC of 30 Kelvin nowadays. So all so that matches. And with this, I come to my conclusion. So I have put forward a very simple description. There are other de descriptions just based on a uh, Hubbard model and a reservoir. And, and our firm believe is that this Hubbard model description is even more justified than for the cuprates. And then I've shown you the phase diagram and the excellent prediction of the experiment. And, um, uh, okay, just um, uh, for the um, discussion, so um, uh, uh, I've put forward here experiment, our theory, and then Frank will put forward the x squared minus y squared plus z squared theory. And, and here is a little bit of an overview of what we can describe and not. And I think, do I still have time to go through it, or? Yeah, yeah okay. So, so we have pretty, of, of course, Frank is, is, uh, can, can maybe put in some question marks uh, here and, and tell us what it's doing. So why, so, so first of all, we have up initially derived this kind of picture. Frank has another picture because he uses SIG DFT as a starting point. And then it's, of course, difficult to say which of the different theories, uh, which are very different, is, is correct. So, so we have actually predicted the phase diagram. And I have to say, you're getting such high TCs as you have in the nickelates. It's maybe small compared to the cuprates. But most of the time, a D gamma A calculation gives you essentially zero for TC. So it's very difficult to, to have a situation a band structure with TCs of 15 or 30 Kelvin. And, and we predicted the phase diagram with astonishing accuracy. I already briefly mentioned the Hall coefficient, so at least the tendency is that, that it is uh, positive for the five layer and it is um, uh, negative and only turns positive at low temperature and high doping for the infinite layer compound is what one would qualitatively expect these tendencies, but we didn't do a calculation yet. Then we get antiferromagnetic spin fluctuations, and well, uh, Ariando will tell us maybe more about different kind of spin fluctuations. There's also spin glass behavior. You also have some ferromagnetism uh, seen uh, in the system. So our point of view is that this spin glass and ferromagnetism is, is due to um, uh, disorder in the system, excess hydrogen or oxygen, but um, antiferromagnetism has been firmly established in, in many experiments indeed. 
The safe doping of the nickel band nicely explains why it's only fluctuations and not long range order. And, and then there is um, uh, uh, quite some discussion about the gap. So we clearly have a D wave, Frank also gets S wave, and in experiments there is also um, different uh, 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 experiment even uh, based on the uh, London penetration depths, uh, Ariando and the uh, group of Harold Wang uh, arrive at uh, different conclusions there. Then there is f no ARPES. So, so ARPES would be, of course, uh, a good way to uh, discriminate between different theories. There is a photo emission spectrum, but, but that is, in my view, a little bit suspicious because there is no density of state, even for the doped compound, which is clearly a metal, which is getting superconducting, and, and therefore, um, so we are for sure in disagreement with this photo emission spectrum and the rigs I already mentioned. So with this overview, um, I would like to thank you for your attention and we will have, I guess, a vivid discussion with different theories and experiments now. Thank you. Yes, uh, I have... I, I have two questions possibly related. I mean, one is I just didn't catch how you parameterize the superconducting scattering in your calculation. What is the input which gives the superconductivity? Mm -hmm. That is number one. And uh, the other is I do not uh, also, maybe you said, but uh, um, this DMFT component in your calculation, is it only shifting away those pockets which you do not see in experiment, or is it actually doing something for the superconducting calculation? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So first of all, so, so we didn't put in, in any scattering by hand. So, so we derived from DFT and DMFT, it's a simple description with x squared minus y squared orbital and an A pocket. We then calculated how many holes go to the x squared minus y squared orbital. And then we calculate the TC of this uh, uh, simple Hubbard model by, by using dynamical vertex approximation. Uh, what, what you get, um, and uh, uh, what was maybe a little bit short uh, in the explanation, is um, we, 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 we get charge fluctuations and spin fluctuations, but, but here we find spin fluctuations to prevail. That is because you have these kind of Fermi surfaces and uh, close to uh, half filling, a little bit doped, and there we just find dominant spin fluctuations. We calculate um, the susceptibility, the vertex of the spin fluctuation, and the vertex of the spin fluctuation th then enter the Cooper channel between the uh, electrons, and, and that gives rise to superconductivity. So, so there's nothing put in. We, we derived everything, as I have explained, from DFT and DMFT. Yeah, which we calculated by CRPA. Um, and this, could you repeat the second question? MFT, does it hmm? do something just to shift the pocket, or does it do something to the superconductivity? So, so DMFT has no D-wave superconductivity. To describe that, we have to go beyond DMFT. Uh, Walter is also an expert on that, so, so we have to use these extensions of DMFT. So from the DMFT calculation in, in our... We, we just get the vertices, local vertices. If you connect these local vertices by local green function, you get the DMFT self-energy. But if you do now non-local green functions, then we get antiferromagnetic spin fluctuations among others. And we see here these antiferromagnetic spin fluctuations dominate. Now, what DMFT does compared to um, uh, DMFT, and uh, what DMFT does compared to DFT, is that you get um, some renormalization, yeah? But the main effect is, as you said, oh, shit. I'm not used to this uh, laser pointer, sorry. Um, so, 
So, so you get, so the DFT bands are like that, and then you get a quasi-particle renormalization by a factor of five, and this quasi-particle renormalization enters in this vertex, and, and uh, from this vertex you can then construct, reconstruct also this DMFT kind of bands. So you get lifetime effects, yeah, that is relevant, um, but, but the spin fluctuation scattering to the lifetime is not included in DMFT, so you need to do this d gamma a to get this pseudo gap phase where additional spin scattering gives rise to opening of a pseudo gap. Yeah, but but as you say here, or uh, see, so so um, uh, you, you get some shift of the gamma pocket, but already in DFT it is strongly dependent on the compound and, and the doping. behind schedule, but we have one more question. Uh, we okay. Try to do okay, first of all, I find this really impressive. <laughs> uh, yes. Congratulations. Uh, my question is, the TC you compute, I guess it's something like a pair formation temperature. I don't know how exact. It Yeah, indirectly it might be possible, but um, what, what we do is we take the spin fluctuation, we go to the particle-particle channel, but we don't put the particle-particle fluctuations back. And because of that, we get uh, a mean field kind of description for the superconducting TC and not a costelid Saulus transition. So, so whether if you do it self-consistently, you get a costelid Saulus transition needs to be seen. Um, uh, but uh, um, uh, because of that, we, we get this mean field uh, and not cost the Saulus transition. But for experiment, it's also much closer to experiment. We have learned yesterday how large systems you need to really see a uh, cost the Saulus transition. And, and also, um, since you have the coupling between the layers, so your correlation length becomes exponentially large. And, and then you easily order, even if the interlayer coupling is very weak. Um, uh, so, so far it's STM experiment and London penetration depth interpretation, but I guess this is a good uh, um, uh, uh, transfer to the next talk. Maybe uh, experiment is, is going to measure in the future such uh, phase uh, dependencies. Thank you.